there are two main kinds of inference questions, must be true and most strongly supported. For must be true questions, you want to look for connections in the stimulus. If nothing jumps out in the answer choices, use process of elimination. And if you see multiple conditionals, diagram. You ID these questions with particular phrases in the question stems. Must be true, logically follows, properly inferred. You're looking for 100% certainty. And when you're in doubt, gravitate towards more moderate language that's more likely to have been guaranteed by the stimulus than more extreme language would be. Most strongly supported questions, on the other hand, have the phrase typically most strongly supported in the question stem. So again, you tell the difference, must be true questions are asking for 100% certainty. On the other hand, most strongly supported questions are asking for something that's incredibly likely to be true, but not necessarily 100% guaranteed. I think of it as very likely to be true, maybe 90% likelihood of success or support or higher than that. Most people don't properly understand necessary assumption questions. They're actually a very specific kind of must be true question. And we can see this with the keywords in the question stems that allow us to identify necessary assumption questions. We have the words depends upon, requires, assumes, presupposes, etc. The approach for these questions is to negate each answer choice. The correct answer choice when negated will destroy the argument's validity. Now here's one of the differences between must be true and necessary assumption. Must be true questions can sometimes be formal logic. They can be fact sets, not arguments. Necessary assumption questions, on the other hand, are always informal logic and always involve arguments. And they're more often looking for something that is unstated in the stimulus. You identify sufficient assumption questions with key words and phrases in the question stem. Phrases like follows logically if assumed, properly inferred if assumed, properly drawn if assumed. Also, words like allows and enables. You approach these questions by guaranteeing the conclusion's validity 100% by linking the evidence with conclusion. This can often be done in a very formal logic way. There are certain formulas and patterns in sufficient assumption correct answer choices such that you can actually predict the correct answer. I have some links on how to do this below this video if you'd like to find out more. Most students have a lot of difficulty telling the difference between necessary assumption and sufficient assumption questions when telling the difference is as simple as looking at keywords and phrases in the question stem. Necessary assumption questions have words and phrases synonymous with necessity, like requires, and sufficient assumption questions have words and phrases in the question stem that are synonymous with sufficiency, like if and allows. It's the key word and phrase in the question stem, often a verb. Necessary assumption questions are looking for something that must be true for the argument to work, but doesn't necessarily have to guarantee the argument. Negation works. You're looking for more moderate language. Sufficient assumptions, on the other hand, don't necessarily have to be true, but if they're true, they guarantee the conclusion 100%. These are often formal logic, so you can diagram, and doesn't matter how extreme the language is, as long as it gets the job done. For strengthening questions, you're looking for new information that makes the conclusion more likely to be valid. So you're looking to support the argument by bridging the gap between the evidence and conclusion. Question stem words and phrases are synonymous with strengthen, like justify and support. Some common ways to strengthen an argument are to deny alternative possibilities and explanations, to promote the evidence's relevance to the conclusion, to support the evidence's validity, if it's based on a study or a survey, and to, of course, just provide additional evidence. Now, strengthening questions open the door to new information. The correct answer can contain information 
not mentioned in the stimulus because the phrase, if true, in the question stem allows new information in the answer choices. One thing that often trips up students is telling the difference between strength and sufficient assumption. And the difference is that sufficient assumption guarantees 100%, whereas strength in just helps, but does not necessarily guarantee the argument. For weakened questions, we're looking to make the conclusion less likely to be valid. So we want to weaken the argument by widening the gap between evidence and conclusion. We identify weakened questions with certain keywords and phrases in the question stem, words that are synonymous with weaken, like undermine, cast doubt, call into question. And the techniques we use are the following. We're typically looking to promote alternative possibilities and explanations, which makes the stated one less likely. We want to deny or weaken the evidence's relevance to the conclusion. If the argument's based upon a study or a survey, we attack the validity of that study or survey. And we can also simply provide additional evidence to attack the conclusion. Remember that we open the door to new information not mentioned in the stimulus because the if true phrase in the question stem opens the door to new information. LSAC has been remarkably creative with the wide variety of ways they ask flaw questions. They might use words like error, questionable, fallacious, unwarranted, weakness, and of course, the phrase vulnerable to criticism. Regardless of how they ask it, the question is the same. They want us to identify the mistake in the method of reasoning in the stimulus. And the best way to approach these questions is actually to determine the mistake for ourselves, be able to articulate it for ourselves, and then look for a description of that flaw in the answer choices. Now, there are a wide variety of flaws out there. Some of them are classic logical fallacies. However, there are also flaws that are unique to the argument's situation itself, where the argument is simply failing to consider something. A lot of students get tripped up when solving weakened questions because they think they have to destroy the argument 100%. In reality, weakened questions are simply asking you to make the conclusion less likely given the evidence, to undermine or hurt the argument, not necessarily to destroy it altogether. Flaw questions, on the other hand, are asking you to identify a problem that already exists with the argument rather than actually asking you to provide new info to harm the argument. So weakened questions open the door to new information. That's why you have the phrase, if true, in the question stem. While flaw questions, on the other hand, don't require any new information at all. That's why you can actually often predict the correct answer because it relates to something already contained within the argument itself. Parallel reasoning questions are pretty simple to identify just because they're so long. You are reading six stimuli for the benefit of one correct answer. In the question stem, you have words like pattern, parallel, similar, similar logical structure. These are some examples of different question stems that you might see. The approach is fairly simple. You want to determine the method of reasoning principle or the flaw in the stimulus, form an abstracted or generalized version of that method of reasoning, and look for the same in the answer choices. If there are multiple conditional statements, you might consider creating a formal logic diagram. If these questions are later in the section, given that they're more time consuming, you might save them for last. But if they're earlier in the section, they're likely to have a simpler method of reasoning or flaw. So just keep that in mind. Conclusion, main point, and complete the argument questions are all pretty much asking for the same thing. Occasionally, you'll find that complete the argument questions are asking you for evidence or something else to fill in the blank. But regardless, your approach is pretty much going to be the same, and it requires that you be really solid on your evidence and conclusion indicator words, understanding the different parts of the argument and the role that they play. So take the time to understand which statements are supporting others, and then 
search the answer choices for the one that describes the argument's ultimate purpose. Why did the author say this? What are they hoping to convince you of? If they could only keep one sentence, what would that be? That's what you're looking for. And you'll notice that it has a certain resonance with main idea in reading comprehension. Resolve the paradox questions will ask you to explain a seemingly confusing or impossible situation. They'll use words like paradox, discrepancy, inconsistency, contradiction, etc. These are all, of course, only apparent discrepancies because it is possible for both of these seemingly impossible situations or mutually exclusive facts to be true. They're looking for us to explain this situation. So we're looking to point out a way for everything in the stimulus to be true at the same time. I like to think of these as variations on flaw questions because someone looking at a seeming paradox would say, these things cannot both be true. These multiple seemingly inconsistent facts cannot both be true, but we point out some possibility or explanation that person had not previously considered that shows how those things could actually be true all at the same time. For point at issue questions, you're looking for an answer choice where both parties express an opinion on the given choice and those opinions differ. So one person would have to say yes to the given answer choice. The other person would say no to that answer choice. Wrong answer choices will often have one person expressing an opinion on the answer choice and the other person expressing no opinion at all. Another thing to look for is that person B, the second person, will also directly disagree or contradict whatever came immediately before. So a lot of times you want to look at the end of person A's statement and the beginning of person B's statement, and that's where the disagreement will lie. Role of statement questions are one of those more abstract question types that require us to identify different parts of the argument in the stimulus to determine how a given statement fits in. I would recommend approaching these by analyzing the argument, finding the conclusion, then looking for the evidence. Then you take your given statement in the question stem and see what role it plays. Is it evidence? Is it conclusion? Is it a subsidiary conclusion? Is it a counter premise? It could be any one of these things, but you've got to understand the argument as a whole in order to understand the role that a given statement plays. As an exercise, analyze all the answer choices for their abstract language and look up the definitions of any words or phrases you don't understand. Method of reasoning questions are another one of those more abstract question types that require us to determine how the author goes about making their argument. So keywords or phrases in the question stem, of course, include methods of reasoning, argument proceeds by, so-and-so responds by, or someone employs certain strategies or techniques. So we want to determine the type of evidence used to support the argument's conclusion. Again, how does the author go about making their argument? Do they use a study or a survey? Do they make an argument by analogy? These are the kinds of things to be looking for, and you can improve your understanding of abstract logical reasoning language by looking up the definitions of words and phrases in the various answer choices, both the right answer choice as well as the wrong ones. Principle questions are one of those more abstract or meta question types that require you to think bigger picture. They're indicated by words like proposition or principle, and they take two forms, each one asking for seemingly different things. The first form, which is the first two question stems here, is asking you simply for a generalized version or form of the argument itself in abstract terms. The second type, which is the final question stem listed here, is simply asking you to strengthen the argument. Either way, you want to approach these principal questions by looking for a more generalized version of the argument itself. For a strengthened principal question, you're looking for a more generalized version of the argument because if a generalized version of the argument as a principle were valid, the specific case referenced in the stimulus 
would be valid or justified as well.